I think you're probably ready to go. Yeah. All right. So hi, everybody. Um, if those of you who are on the call can't hear us, let us know. Um, so welcome to our panel today. Between Jamal and I, we're going to be chatting and kind of showing off uh, some demos of technology about the future of experiential learning, kind of learning in general with extended reality. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm faculty here. I'm a teaching professor in uh, art and design. I'm a member of the Center for Design. And I'm also over in the College of Engineering. I teach in the Sherman Center for Engineering Entrepreneurship over there. Um, this year, I'm also the, the uh, division head of Creative Media, and I'm the director of XR Initiatives for the college. So um, there's a lot of really interesting stuff going on. So I'm going to try and cover um, just a quick introduction to like what XR is and like where the technology is going because it is a field that's so technologically driven. Then we're going to show off some demos of things. Um, you know, Jamal is going to show off a demo of some of the stuff that he's been working on. And then we're going to open it up basically to questions and things. I have some questions that I'm happy for Jamal and I to talk about if there are specific topics, but certainly if you have questions, um, we can definitely go over them. I, I, we should have plenty of time. Um, and then with any extra time that we have, obviously Jamal and I have some hardware here that uh, people are welcome to give a try to. If you just kind of want to get a sense for what is actually going on with these technologies. Um, so Jamal, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit? Yeah, sure. Uh, my name is Jamal Thorne. I'm a media arts faculty and I've been here for quite some time now. And uh, I think that immersive media is one of those platforms, or sorry, one of those um, spaces that's kind of emerging still. And I kind of find that interesting. A lot hasn't been done. And as a studio artist myself, I think that space where not a lot has been done is really, really exciting because it means that, you know, we can really get in there, get our hands dirty, start to play, experiment, and really start to ask questions, like we can answer questions. Yeah. Yeah, one of the more interesting things, and, and one of the reasons why I really um, have enjoyed our, our collaboration so far is that a lot of the stuff that you'll see out there, um, like the base use cases for the home is too, a lot of stuff that Meta is doing is very STEM focused. It's very much like advanced manufacturing, technicians using this kind of stuff. And there's much, much less kind of outside of that realm. And so Jamal really brings a unique perspective coming out of from a studio artist and thinking about how these tools can be used in that kind of practice. But then that can be generalized out to learn basically any kind of skill. And so a lot of the stuff that I'm doing is, is quite frankly more boring because it's more of what is expected of these technologies because they're coming from a step background. Uh, but we'll, we'll talk about both as we go ahead and move forward. So what we're actually talking about here, if you haven't heard the term extended reality, um, it's really an umbrella term, kind of like 3D printing became an umbrella term for a whole bunch of different technologies. Extended reality is a similar thing. Um, so the three main ones that you see around are virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality. The way to think about them is with virtual reality, what you have is a headset that occludes the entire um, real world, and you're placed in an immersive environment that is wholly created or is a videotaped version, a video recorded version of some other location or something like that. But it's fully immersive. You are no longer sensing in any real way the world around you. You are immersed in this virtual world. Augmented reality is a little bit different. The kind of the most base use case for it is using your phone, things like Pokemon Go or the IKEA app. Uh, Wayfair has another app too, where you're placing digital objects into the into a recording or a video feed of the real world. So you're not seeing the real world with your eyes. You're seeing a screen. That screen is an intermediary that's recording the real world and placing digital objects in front of that, okay? Mixed reality, as uh, Microsoft tends to define it, mixed reality and augmented reality are a little bit squishy in definition. It doesn't seem like industries have figured out what they want to do with them yet, but mixed reality is like the whole lens here where you are seeing the real world, the lenses are see-through, but then digital elements are laid on top of that real world in some kind of hologram projection, some, something that uses uh, something like that. Then the other term that's thrown around in the general vicinity of these that I just like to introduce a little bit is the term metaverse. Um, it has died down a little bit in, the, in uh, let's say, the past six months or so, but it is still kind of thought of as being part of XR technology because if there's any kind of virtual world setup that a metaverse goes to get, it's likely to be interacted with with some kind of extended reality technology. Um, so just to give you an indication of, of some of these technologies and where we're at, the most, these are the most common technologies. They're not the most advanced. We'll talk about those in the next slide. But the Oculus Quest 2, which I have one around here somewhere, 
is kind of like the most basic form of uh, a best selling headset in terms of actual virtual reality. Um, it's uh, kind of like your entry level. The technology is very good. The technology has increased in terms of what's called inside out tracking or the tracking technology in general has increased really, really quickly in the past, say, five years. And so if uh, for a lot of our use cases, in order to get this technology out to the most amount of hands, we're going to be using something like a Quest 2, at least for the time being. Um, iPhones or phones in general are the easiest way that people use augmented reality. I have an asterisk there because most people already have this device in their hands. And so there's kind of like no cost because people already have this for some other use case, right? So when Jamal is teaching one of our courses here, the um, you know, uh, introduction to extent, uh, immersive reality, immersive media, that's, sorry, it's a lot of names going on here. Um, what he's doing, teaching that class, you don't really need to worry about giving out phones to students because most of the students will already have them. And so like that kind of lowers the barrier necessary to be able to use these technologies. Um, and then the last one, the Microsoft HoloLens that you see Jamal and I with here, these are $3,500 as like a base point and then there's software on top of that. So that is a harder piece of technology to get out of people's hands. There's a lot more kind of uh, other pieces to that. Um, and you know, the HoloLens 2 is really somewhat of a prototype still. Um, a lot of it's still like a development platform. So it's not necessarily meant to be out there even for like business to business use cases or for consumer consumption. So, um, but I think we will end up seeing changes to that over the next couple of years, which will bring me to my next slide. Got, got anything for this you want to want to want to move on and talk about the current technologies that have been released so in the past six months um, in fact the one at the top here that's the uh the, the uh Vi, htc vibe elite um that's being released in like a week i think it comes out at the end of the month um the uh quest pro was released in like october from meta and then the psvr2 is over here which is also i think either just released or, or is out there now for um, you know, for the purposes of, of uh, people being able to demo it. Um, and the fascinating thing about these devices is that they are integrating augmented and mixed reality with VR. So they're kind of a headset that's doing everything. So you can actually see on both of these, there are kind of uh, cameras or like lenses. And then you can actually put a cover on the front to fully occlude the, um, fully occlude the headset making it into a VR setup. So they are like combining all of these things together into essentially an XR headset. That's where they're kind of coming from with it. That's a trend that I think would be expected to continue because it is still a very niche technology and having dedicated hardware for these different umbrella terms for these different categories doesn't necessarily make sense. Um, both of these are actually uh, more affordable than the Microsoft HoloLens and more affordable than some of the previous um, desktop computer-based headsets. These are, are free-floating. You, you can use them kind of like Oculus Quest 2. They don't require a computer, although they will sync up to an app on your phone. That's the main way that you can kind of interact with them. Um, and the HTC, I think, is like between 1,000 and 1,500, depending on options. And the, um, the Meta headset is $1,000. Okay, then PSVR, I think, is an interesting one. The reason why I have it up there is that it's released, comes with the, hooks up to the PS5, but it's likely one of the easiest ways to get people into VR because it's just like a very set pathway. Um, and the original PSVR did that as well. The install base size and kind of all that other stuff is yet to be determined, but I do think it's it's just kind of an interesting addition because it's dedicated VR only. It doesn't really have um, any uh, mixed reality for sure. It could potentially have some augmented reality using like what's called pass-through technology, meaning it's using the cameras on the outside in order to actually kind of display the real world, although there could be some lag issues with that. Um, then the other bullet point I have up here is the Apple rumors. For years now, Apple has been rumored to have an augmented reality headset. Uh, the rumors are getting a little bit more firm where most people expect it potentially in this year. Um, I wish I had better information on it to tell you. I think it's I think it's definitely interesting. I think it would it's in the realm of plausibility for sure that they would enter this market. Um, when they do it and what they actually release, the scope of that release and everything else, I think it's yet to be seen, right? No one really knows. There are other kind of headsets out there. There's actually a pair of Ray-Bans that was associated with Snap uh, and Snapchat that's like $300 that does some augmented reality stuff. So like, there are some other ways to get out there with these technologies, but um, you know, having Meta 
and uh, HTC be the big ones, um, and then having Apple join join in as well as like Microsoft. Those are some of like the biggest tech companies around in this area. Um, so I think at some point there is an expectation that Apple does end up doing something, um, and what that does to the actual market that you know, TBD. Okay. So um, barriers to adoption then, and, and like this is where it starts to come into our education stuff, access to the technology. I mean, it just showed the cost. This is expensive stuff. Like this is not necessarily something you can expect students to buy on their own or have access to. And uh, therefore what that means is that we need the infrastructure to be able to manage checking headsets in and out, which we do here through our immersive media lab, which is staffed and, and has a, you know, a ton of stuff going on. And so we need to, um, you know, really need to think about how we want to integrate this stuff with the knowledge that it may be inaccessible, right? And I mentioned earlier um, as well, like you know, people wearing glasses, some, sometimes the technology is great, people makes them sick, et cetera, et cetera. So there's definitely like barriers to the access to this technology. Um, also space required, okay? Um, a lot of rooms that we have, say here on the university campus are reconfigurable, movable tables, movable desks, all that stuff, so you can be able to do it. But then there are plenty of classrooms that are not like we have big lecture halls and everything else. And so thinking about the dedicated space necessary to be able to do, especially some of the more interesting interactions with multiple people, is just something you can keep in mind. Um, then the last two are, are kind of paired together, knowledge of the creation tools. We started our immersive media minor uh, about a couple of years ago, and it's aimed at trying to give people the skills necessary to be able to uh, build XR experiences. Uh, but it's just a minor, and, and we have other um, other offerings coming. We have an, an MS degree that's going to be showing up relatively soon. We have some other kind of higher level courses that are going to be showing up in the next like year or so. Um, so, so we are coming up with these things, but there's still a very big bottle in terms of knowledge of these creation tools and the amount of effort necessary to be able to create these experiences. Um, and that leads to the last bullet being the content itself. Uh, you know, Jamal and I have spent a lot of time like working on the content that we have, and um, you know, it's not necessarily feasible for a lot of educators in a lot of areas to be able to take this on themselves. Like, there needs to be like dedication of a team um, and kind of thought through better tools to be able to actually uh, you know bring this to a wider audience. Uh, there's something that I could add here. Uh, just kind of looking at these last two points: knowledge creation tools and content. I think the technology is at this point such that it allows for really, really diverse modes of you know, working, of consumption. And I think that really does put a focus on content itself, like the stories are being told, the narrative, uh, what are the use cases in terms of education, in terms of even military application. But I think that there is something to be said about the kind of knowledge gap that's slowly being closed. Like at one point, you had to have like really, really deep knowledge of coding practices to create content for any of these platforms. Gradually, that's starting to, you know, shift in terms of, you know, what kind of applications become software and use to create content. Um, there are all kinds of exciting, you know, web apps like Hoverlay that really eliminate to know like coding and how to like, you know, use tracking software. And even different like packages that you can download from like websites and use them in Unity. They kind of create this really accessible space for creators to, you know, just jump in and start just playing. I think when creators get a chance to play and just goof around, I think that's when we start to see like real real content emerge because those creators that are able to play and experiment, they start to figure things out, they start to understand more. They start to, you know, really plug in their own content to the knowledge that they're developing. Yeah, and, and one of the, you know, one of the other kind of downsides of XR technology in general is that it's a hard thing. You know, Jamal's going to show some videos later. I showed some of the screen earlier when I was messing around in the hall when we were waiting to start. And like, that's a good way of being able to see the experience a little bit, but it, there's no real way to translate to actually trying it yourself. And so it's like, there needs to be kind of buy-in to be able to try it yourself, but like the steps in front of that buying expensive equipment, like there's just, there is a lot of friction in the system. And until that's reduced, I don't think you're going to see widespread adoption. All right, so just some statistics to throw out there. 
So 88% uh, of people in a couple of surveys that I saw believe that XR can improve education. That's not necessarily surprising. People believe that technology can improve all over the place. Um, the market size is expected to grow by 200% by 2026 from where it is now. You know, it's, it, that brings it to somewhere around like 25 to $30 billion, which is pretty big. Um, the largest growth is expected in healthcare and training. Uh, again, I don't necessarily think this is surprising. Um, you know, we've been working a little bit with uh, some of our anatomy folks here and biology folks here about the kinds of stuff that they do. And because a lot of their, uh, a lot of the, the skills that they need to know and everything else transfer to the real world, there's already a huge market for say like healthcare simulation, right? There are very expensive dummies. There are all kinds of like, you know, uh, tasks you must do, clinicals you must run. So I don't think it's really surprising that these areas would be some of the biggest ones, especially because they're um, also both very data-rich environments, right? Healthcare is a very data-rich environment with MRI scans, you know, uh, vital signs of people like how their breathing rate, their O2, like, so, so there, all this information is already existing in the system. So repackaging that in better ways to make people more efficient or to reduce errors, I think makes perfect sense. Um, the last thing, 30 million XR headsets expected to ship by 2026. The analysis that I was looking at when I read this doesn't include anything from Apple. Like I mentioned before, that could be a big player out there. And like, that's actually not that big of a number, right? So 30 million seems like a lot, but it's, it's not really a lot when compared to say like laptops or cell phones or anything like that. So I think it's still going to be a relatively niche device as we get into kind of the second half of this decade. Um, but I do think we will continue to see higher and higher adoption. I, I because of my background, um, I compared a lot of times to 3D printing, where 3D printing and VR technology are actually both things that were developed in the 80s, but then they didn't really see widespread adoption until like 30 years later, basically around the 2010s. And at that time, it's because of the, the barrier to entry just got very low with 3D printers. And now we have fewer different electronic printers and cheaper ones, students have them in their dorm rooms because they're just like easy to get. The technology got better. It got kind of like hobbyist level stuff. And so it became a lot easier. I expect that we will probably hit something like that with these kinds of technologies, or what will happen is we'll have a shift somewhat like phones, where it becomes a device that we use in our everyday life with proven use cases, and then there's just much wider adoption. Um, but I don't think we're there yet, I guess is what I would say. Okay. Um, so education specifically. So, so um, before, in, in preparation for this, I dug through some of the latest research that we have on XR and education. This has been ongoing for a while. At least it, it's kind of definitely picked up in the last decade with the new technologies that have been showing up. And quite frankly, the increase in the tracking technology has just gotten so much better that it's just way more reliable than it used to be. So um, it was significantly boosted by COVID. So what we're seeing now is kind of like a deluge of studies and papers that were started during COVID because this is something that you can do remotely. You can kind of put people in their own room. People could wear a mask while wearing these and it wouldn't be too, too foggy. So like this was all very possible during the pandemic. So there's a ton of science coming out now, um, which is interesting to see. Lots of small studies though. And so lots of small impacts. There's not really consensus on a lot of these areas. I think that will take, uh, to bring it back to another area. So I, I was part of doing a lot of serious games like games for education and games for learning. And they run into a lot of the similar problems that XR for education does, which is like any technology that's added there, which is, does this transfer? Is this just a novelty effect? Being it's just like a cool thing for people to try, therefore they think it's fun to do, so therefore their learning is higher. That is yet to be kind of uh, teased out in the same way that it took about a decade for serious games to kind of find their footing and be able to be used where now we have games that are actually potentially given out as medical interventions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and as part of learning in, in kind of broad adoption even in, in schools across the US. Um, so here's some of the, the findings, the one or bullets I have there. It better than video or e-learning for training. Again, I don't think this is particularly surprising. It is a more immersive uh, thing. What we've seen in some of the pilot studies that Jamal and I have run is that video is the other thing that in particular, if you're teaching someone a skill they're doing in the real world, the fact that the HoloLens, for instance, is hands-free is a huge advantage because people don't need to be working on something and they're constantly pausing a video and like going back and forth eyes and keep their time on task, which brings me to the second one. Um, better focus on time on task because they're not being diverted back to the materials re-looking at a book 
we look at written materials, we look at the video. Um, customized learning environments is also something that's being explored, which I think is interesting. So you can focus more on particular tasks or do more of an activity to build up skill in a certain area where it's not like a linear progression. You basically are able to have kind of uh, customized learning, which I think is one of the more interesting aspects of using something like XR. Um, and then learning with XR has better information retention than lectures or video. Again, all this kind of piles up to the same thing, where if you have more time on task, you have better focus, you're likely to do better learning. There's also an area of the learning sciences that's about dual coding, where if you're able to see and hear at the same time, meaning you see information like images, as well as hearing about it audibly, that you have a higher level of learning. The immersive nature of XR brings that out so no huge surprises, no huge effects, expected things. So the science is definitely out there that this can be a useful tool in education. And that's why I think there's kind of like the lowest hanging fruit of like healthcare and training, kind of STEM manufacturing stuff, those kinds of things are what we're going to see first because they're the most obvious. All right, I'll do some, do some demos here. How do, you want to, how do you want to show your videos? So do you want to bring them up on mic for your ear? Sure, I can do that. Um... Yeah, just join the. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Let me see if I can add your holes. Yeah, why don't you bring up your also if I can add your holes. Thank you, sir. Why was it making money? Uh, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Let's see exactly what I do now. Um, okay. All right, so uh, Mark and I have been working on a few different projects here. Um, one of, and I should say, kind of like Mark said, you know, the quote unquote lowest hanging fruit here uh, is really kind of education, training, et cetera. And so, in our experiences with Duplex technology and teaching studio courses, we kind of had some great, we like a lot of pain points. You know, how do you teach a person to sculpt while they are like, uh, and the same question can be applied when you're asking, well, how do you think somebody had it draw when they're not in the same space as models that are being drawn, subjects that are being drawn, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So initially, we started thinking about fitting XR technology into the studio space in a number of different ways. We thought about expert where to be able to see things from the perspective of the instructor. We thought about uh, remote fatigue. Uh, options where basically critique setting we 
generate uh, would be recorded and streamed in the 360 video. And we also thought about different ways to actually engage or like let students engage and drawing practices remotely as well in the absence of the actual subject. They were sculpting, painting, or drawing. And the use of Microsoft Dynamic Guides really provided a good, interesting solution to that last question. How do we get a student to be able to draw something that you know they don't see physically right there? With the HoloLens, you're able to input and drag uh, 3D models into these spaces. And I found um, with students and myself that they're pretty viable and they're compared to physical objects. So what you're gonna see is three different tiers here. This is again, very, very uh, basic prototype at this moment. But when I teach drawing, I specifically teach, you know, a scaffold. So I will work with cubes first. So with this particular, Example, and yes, you'll see my kid's room here. Ironically, it's the one place in my home where there's like very, very open space. But essentially what we're able to do is present the subject that needs to be drawn. And in this case, it's a cube with a couple of tips and ideas on how to approach drawing that cube one bit at a time. And the student, uh, in my experience, you know, it works with both sketchbook and with a larger drawing pad, as you might be able to see here. The subject is instead a holographic projection presented to the hollow, and that is what they're drawing. Now, those subjects, these 3D models, are lit and modeled in specific software like Blender, Maya, and things like that. Then those models are then dragged into the Microsoft Guides app, and they're presented one step at a time. And essentially, Kind of starting with the most basic, basic, you know, iteration of the cube. Start there, and we start to get to other things, such as the multi-cube. So this is for observational drawing. So unlike you just like presented students with an image of a cube, this cube students can actually move around in space and see. It. It is an actual 3D hologram of the object. And so that presents an obvious advantage over something like just plain old images that you're drawing on a 2D space. Because one of the things that Jamal is attempting to teach here is the conversion from 3D to 2D. And so because this is a real 3D object, it still maintains as if it was in the real world. There's also something. Um that I find quite remarkable about this practice. Um, and actually Mark uh, might have like put me onto this idea a little bit early. The fact that you could, you know, prospectively record a student doing their work, record a student drawing, and then play those recordings, you know, you know for an instructor for a class, then really observe how a student is reconstructing what they're seeing and then reconstructing it on a two-dimensional surface. It provides a different level of, you know, a different level of engagement because then we can really talk about well, are you starting there or are you starting there? Drawing? Are you starting at these corners or those corners? Are you there starting at these vertices or those? Maybe it might be a little bit better if you tried starting here or looking at this first. Yeah, and that actually came from another study that I did with some other colleagues where we actually looked at um, young, younger, inexperienced doctors versus more experienced doctors. We did eye tracking to see how they look at ultrasounds. And the experienced doctors are way more efficient for obvious reasons looking at ultrasounds. They know exactly where to look and everything, but in training new doctors, you don't really talk about that. You point to the various things that you see on an ultrasound, but you don't take that extra step of being like, you should look, like thinking about how you look, the actual process of that. And so having kind of richer data and being able to actually see like eye tracking or something like that kind of unlocks that learning circuit learning circuit of the actual process of how this is done in a way that other tools without like this level of technology just can't accomplish. Um, and so that's one of the things that I think we're really still trying to scratch the surface of is like, what does it actually mean when you can kind of get an expert's view of this stuff in real time or have an expert review your process to be able to get not just to the outcome and kind of have them divine their way backwards using their experience of the expert, but actually be able to see in real time, like, critique in real time. Yeah. 
And so with this particular idea, again, it's scaffolded. So gradually we get to more complex forms. And um, for example, this form that's got rounded edges, edges, sorry, uh, value points and tone points that gradually shift into one another, transitioning from dark to light to create the illusion of form on a two-dimensional surface. Um, this is what I would categorize as something a little bit more complicated. And so even this particular form that's being drawn, it, it's, it's complicated, but not too complicated. Um, there is a world that I think we envision where we actually build entire digital still lives and gradually, you know, scaffold and build into a person drawing those digital, those digitized still lives that are uh, apparently through this device like three dimension. Yeah, I mean, the other advantage that we have with being able to use you know, digital uh, assets, digital holograms for this is that we can also change them very rapidly. We can change the way the lighting looks on them, change their sizes, change their material, make it metallic, you can do all these things that you can't really even do in a normal classroom unless you just have you know, a huge basket full of all these different objects that you slap on the table. So we have kind of a more uh, interesting set of variables in real time to be able to help students kind of understand and therefore potentially transfer their knowledge outside of the activity they're doing into a more generalized version, which is you know, how learning actually is accomplished. We managed to get to you. You need a lot of your pants. Yeah. Any question? Bye. Um, so while he's doing that, I should also say that I got a chance to do some very preliminary tests with students because, yes, I do teach observation of drawing. So I gave students the opportunity to get extra credit if they actually worked with this uh, device, with these things, materials that I put together with Mark. And one of the things that, you know, a bit of feedback that I got from the students is that, quite simply, is it's cool. They're like, this is really, really cool because they thought it was so interesting. So cool. Well, I think you know, Mark kind of alluded to the novelty uh, aspect of this entire experience here. They were really interested in repeating the exercises. And so as they repeat exercises, and this is kind of something that's consistent with anything having to do with studio art, if you do things a lot, get better at it. Very, very simple. And so because they were very interested in repeating these exercises, I noticed a really dramatic shift in their abilities in the classroom. It was very, very rewarding. I thought it was kind of funny, almost made me cry a little bit, you know, because I tell you, when I teach a drawing class, watching a student get better is one of the things that just makes me feel good about what I'm doing at the moment. So yeah, they were very interested in repeating these exercises, and so they got better. Furthermore, uh, another bit of feedback that I got from students was that the lighting on the models was consistent. So when you're teaching a drawing class, a spatial drawing class, a lot of the times your subjects are put through windows. And obviously, the position of the sun changes, and that changes the light source, and that can change the overall appearance of the subject being drawn by the students. Now, having to contend with those shifts, those very, very subtle shifts, can be challenging for the drawer. And so the light source being consistent with the three models, they said made it really, really good and easy for them to really just take their time drawing the model uh, and follow it. So again, like that was one of the things we just see that it's just a little bit, I wouldn't say better, but just a little bit different from teaching these uh, techniques in the classroom. And yeah, it's it was really, really rewarding and interesting to see observational drawing students like work with stuff and see the changes in the classroom and then start to envision how.
how these kinds of opportunities, this use of technology, can not only, sorry, can not only be uh, used in like a studio classroom, like a job station drawing or painting or sculpting. But starting to envision what you know a design class might look like as well, like basic design principles, understanding 2D and 3D, and using you know technology like this to kind of reinforce those lessons that taught in these classes. Yeah, I'm going to try and share it to optimize for the video. Oh. So one of the things that I should say is that when you see the videos of these materials, um, the models themselves don't look like the way they're supposed to look in the videos. They look very, very different when you are in headset. Um, they feel larger, they feel more present. They're a little bit more um, just, they feel heavier, I guess is really what I mean. So that really does matter you're talking about drawing something um, from scratch rather than, you know, drawing something that feels transparent, drawing something that feels like it's got weight to it, that really does impact the learning process when you're drawing. Sorry, give me one moment here to do this. The model like right there. And for those of you that are watching remotely, there is a little bit of a delay here. Yeah, so we're using um, a software here that has a terrible name. It's called Dynamic 365 Guides, which is just <laughs> like a mouthful, a mouthful of nothing. Uh, but you saw a kind of guides show up there. Um, it's essentially like a very, very simple uh, holographic PowerPoint. You can essentially make slides that have text or images or uh, models associated with them, but it's very bare bones. It's very much like a, you know, still very much a prototype. Um, but it is the best way to kind of get this information out there. But you can't even like format the text that you see, you can't change the size. It's just, we're still very, very early on these technologies. But on the flip side, it's essentially like, it's essentially as difficult as power to be able to use. So you can develop, um, the guide using a laptop and then put on the headset, test things, move around where the boxes are, like he's able to adjust where the model is. So it's it's a uh, it's a development process that's both in headset and on a, a laptop, which is really kind of interesting. Um, and so one of the ones that I developed, which we won't show today, is actually training someone to use a 3D printer. And so I had it set up so when you look at a 3D printer, there's arrows that discuss where everything is, the objects that show you like how to do things, it's actually meant to do tasks. Like I said, a little bit kind of more boring, it's more what you'd expect someone to use this headset for, but it is still you know, very doable. And the process itself to develop something like that, the training is I think around 35 minutes long. It only took me probably like an hour, hour and a half to actually create the training. And granted, I'm, I'm like a fairly experienced person using these tools now, but we're not talking it didn't require any programming. It didn't require really any kind of special knowledge. It really was just kind of like developing the steps all the way through. So hopefully as the software gets more robust and there are more tools out there, that's the kind of creation we talk about. Yeah. So, you know, kind of just looking here, uh, again, in headset, it's far more smoother. There's not so much lag, but, um, you know, I'm looking at this space right here and physically you guys that are in the room, like obviously there's nothing there, but I'm able to really just, you know, do this, this whole thing here. Sighting lines, et cetera. And there are a few tips. I uh, add a few tips in the dialog boxes right next to the instructions. There's 
you know, again, more challenging models where the position of the model really makes the challenge. We call this foreshortening. You can't see, you know, three sides, but really you can only see two sides, the top and the forward side. It'd be pretty challenging. I'm keeping it. I'm keeping it light and loose here. <laughs> the other thing that you um, that we can do with the HoloLens itself is it can actually record its own video, not in real time, and so it's not nearly as, as kind of uh, laggy like this because we're going from the headset to my laptop to Zoom. It's like it's definitely choppy, but um, ordinarily it, it the video that it records is, is what you saw from um, Jamal's demos earlier, and so that's what we tend to use. But I do think that this technology needs to get better as well, so that it's easier to see and it's not kind of as, as diced up. But like I said, we're kind of, uh, you know, we're kind of stuck using using what they, they currently have available for some of these, uh, some of these steps. And something that I also wanted to make sure that I said here as well, like Mark said earlier, you can move around these models. So, you know, if I really wanted to, you know, get mobile, if I had a sketchbook with me, then it's nothing for me to, you know, switch and get this vantage point here if I wanted to. Like say if I wanted to practice this curve here, maybe practice like getting this kind of uh, the shadowing. So there's a lot of versatility in terms of being able to, you know, move around the model. And again, it's really, really important for the student that's learning how to do all this stuff with a pencil. Um, so I have, I have just kind of, um, just one more slide just to talk a little bit about of what Northeastern is up to now, um, kind of what we're doing with this stuff. And then, um, you know, I'll open it up to any questions. Uh, Jamal and I have some other questions or we can let people kind of use some of the tools and stuff as well with the time that we have remaining. So, um, Um, so, you know, we have some focus areas here at the university that we're doing, we're kind of putting together, um, and I have them listed here. So educational experiential learning, obviously it's what we've been talking about today. But we're also looking at communication and immersive media, um, which is kind of another area that Jamal is interested in. He's done some stuff with St. Brush, which is like a reading painting program. Um, <clears throat> future of health, the future of work in general, that's talking about like, you know, how we use these technologies in day-to-day -day life. Um, advanced manufacturing, that again is kind of like, like the low hanging fruit where like there are obvious uses for this. I'm on several projects that do it and it's great. It's great stuff, but it's just, I think it's the most expected way to use it. So it'll be kind of like the first areas of the technology to be conquered. Um, and then the XR tech itself, like I said, there's kind of only the big uh, companies putting these machines out. And there's not a lot of integration of other sensors or other technologies that we'll see. I think we will see kind of more platforms that are introducing other things. Um, HTC, uh, they introduced a, just a new tracker, um, <clears throat> which is a device about you know the size of, of say like a uh, um, you know like a hockey puck. And the idea with that is that you can actually attach it to objects and then interact with that object in the virtual world. Okay, it has its own inside-out tracking technology, so it knows where it is in relation to the headset, even if the headset doesn't see it. 
So if you want to do more advanced things than just like the hand controllers or having nothing in your hands, I think we are moving towards that, um, but we're not we're not going to be there again for a little while. But that's kind of stuff that we're doing here at Northeastern. Um, like I said, we are having more academic offerings. There's tons of research going on. On there's a lot of demands. Uh, we have a lot of you know co-op companies that want our students to have these, these skills, and a lot of students that want these skills. So it's all stuff that we're working on, and we're trying to stay kind of in front of the lead as it comes to crash. But there's a lot going on. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thank you. Questions? Yeah. Uh, so you kind of mentioned a little about how because it's a novel student, people are more interested in learning it. But you personally, or students even maybe the tech limitations of it, notice that novels are not. At the moment, you no. Know, it, it's still pretty solid. Um, and I'm not sure, I'm not sure that it will. Maybe that's me being an optimist because I am an optimist. <laughs> but, you know, when you think about just the fact that you're sitting there with a the headset drawing something that doesn't exist in real space, like, there is something that's always, I think, magical about that. I think there's something magical about, like, just the concept of a hologram in general. Uh, the fact that we're able to see something that doesn't exist in real space, I think, alludes to all of these things that we see in movies all this kind of like perceived future that I think we are actually starting to like bump face first into quite a bit face first into. So I think that magic aspect, it, it, I, I don't think it's going to blur away. I mean, when I think about, you know, iPhones and smartphone technology, you know, these things are still happening uh, for a couple of different reasons. You know, I think a lot of it has to do with the device itself, but I also think it has to do with content. Which is why I think we were interested in the kind of conference presented in this fashion to keep that novelty aspect kind of alive as well. Yeah, the other thing that I would say is I think that uh, you know we very explicitly kind of built the experiences that we have to attempt to avoid that. But I think if you were to say um, just give everybody Oculus Plus twos and then you were teaching on a history class and you just did nothing but 360 videos. I think there would be a novelty effect there where students at a certain point would be like, hey, like, let's just watch a regular video because you're not really, um, you're not getting as much out of it. Where like the activities that Jamal built and some of the stuff that I've done just like very explicitly has goals in mind for it. And so I think that we're kind of avoiding that. So one of the things, both Jamal, having, Jamal and I having taught with these technologies, one of the things that I like to do is, you know, we, we give out students like an Oculus Quest 2 I give them out to them and I say, hey, you know, we have these for a week, try a bunch of stuff. And I come back and I ask people like, well, so after you, and, and they're always like, this is really great. They try a whole bunch of things. And then you ask them a week later and be like, oh, are you still using it like as much as you were? And almost nobody is because a lot of it is that kind of novelty effect. I, I liken it back to, you know, I think many of you are, are not are not too young for it, but when the uh, Nintendo Wii first came out, there was just this huge novelty effect of basically like shaking the controllers. Sports was like this huge kind of, just just unbelievable uh, kind of item in the zeitgeist of the world. It was kind of like Pokemon Go when Pokemon Go first came out. And there definitely is like a dying off of novelty of that point, but then there are definitely like deeper good experiences that still use that technology, but then a lot didn't. A lot just were like, it was just like shaking the controller or whatever. And so I think it's going, there is going to be a novelty effect when it's used incorrectly or used for things where it just doesn't matter. It's much, right? Like where, where it's just like, it's not, it, it, it's interesting the first time around, but it's not leading to those kind of deeper levels of learning that we're looking for. Where, you know, what Jamal is focusing on, which is like the repeatability of relatively short run activities, as well as like, like I said, zeroing in on the process of doing it. That I think is the advantage you can't get in another way, like if you just submit a work or whatever else. And so that's what kind of uh, allows us to avoid the novelty of this, that I think this technology is looking at. Any other questions? So there have been kind of speculations or just talk about if this technology were to like spread and people have more access to it, that it might be detrimental to the mental health. But your takes on that be and how can we as designers prevent that? 
Yeah, I mean, I think there definitely there's there's more to be done. Um, but you know, people have interacted with screens for a long time, and there are some there's good data on on the impacts of mental health for that kind of thing. That's why, again, I think what we're trying to focus on is like specific interventions and not so much like just use this all day, every day, which is like, say, like what's on phones, where it's just like we're looking for engagement. That's the only thing we care about. That's really not the goal, I think, of a lot of XR uh, experiences that I've seen. It's much more in the realm of like what is a, you know, uh, specific goal oriented intervention for a specific task. And that's really what we're looking for. And so I think we can kind of get away from some of the other pieces. I mean, the other, in some ways, there's a self-regulating um, mechanism as well, especially with VR, where like even people who have a lot of VR experience, like me, like at a certain point, I will get sick. I will start to feel like this is no longer great. It's like it's like if you did nothing but sit there and eat MMs for a while, like even people who really love MMs, like I do, like there is a threshold where you're like, no more MMs. And, um, you know, that varies much lower with other technologies that have a negative impact on mental health. And so I definitely think that there's there's a worry. And one of the big things that still come out is um, they actually don't recommend any of the VR headsets for children under 12. And there are some concerns about their kind of motor control and balance with that. Um, that has not been super studied for people who are like wearing stuff a ton, um, say for like their, their work or whatever. I think that, you know, adults like Jamal and I using it even as much as I use it, we're only talking like at most like an hour or so, an hour or two a day, not even every day. Um, if we get to a certain threshold where everybody is wearing augmented reality glasses and like we aren't using it a lot of work, I think data network definitely needs to come out with a lot of that stuff as well as like, you know, fit and better stuff for people wearing glasses, all these kinds of other aspects that people have. Um, you know, people that, that lack the depth perception, like there's all kinds of things that you can look at. But because it's still such a niche device, it just hasn't been practiced. Yeah, and I agree with Mark here. Like, it, it's, I, I think it's more about the intent of goal. And if there's a goal in mind and it's very, very directed, pointed, um, I think that kind of starts to address like some of those mental health concerns. Because I actually am the of some of the larger questions that I had about all this technology. You know, I, I remember when Facebook first came out, and none of those questions were being asked. And so as this starts to kind of emerge, that's more ubiquitous and fitting into these spaces a little bit more, I think it's very, very important to ask that exact question. So I have quite often. And kind of works right. Like there is an exposure, like ceiling, like for everybody. Um, and I think also in terms of making these things repeatable, we gotta keep them short. It kind of comes for, for me anyway, it kind of comes out of instructional design a little bit, you know, short. Kind of pointed like steps to get immediate feedback that kind of work for uh, just letting the person like move at their own pace, but also again just keeping it short so that they're not like exposed for like more than an hour. Yeah, yeah, I mean a lot of like kind of like the active learning research that's out there, which again still pretty new, small effects, small studies, um, is showing that somewhere between like 20 and 40 minutes. After that point, I mean many of you, you know, all of you as students here, or students at one point in time. You've experienced being in a class, being really locked in, and then after like 20 to 40 minutes of like say a lecture or an activity, like you are burned out. Like there's there is a threshold at which you're just kind of cooked. And um, the same thing happens in a lot of XR. I mean, one of the other interesting things that's going to happen at a certain point, I, I mentioned kind of the use of extended reality technologies for health, um, but I'm talking more about having the practitioners be using these devices in their day-to-day -day activities. But there is another side of that, which is using XR technologies as a health intervention. And there are some studies out there, some of the most fascinating, I don't know if you've seen this as well, but you can use XR technologies to essentially induce meditation. So for people that have a problem with like getting into a meditative state or kind of that uh, introspection, you can use VR in particular as a way of inducing that. And so what that means, and they've done like brain scans of people who do that, who knows, right? Like, like, could there be medical interventions that, that use this stuff that then lead to other problems? I think we're going to find that. Um, but we're still very, very new. Any other questions? All right. Any questions from the folks online? I have the chat open. If not, I think if anybody wants to try uh, a Holland or something. Um, yeah, we can, we can give it a whirl. Um, 
I don't know if you want to leave the, the call up or or what. Um, we'll, we'll go ahead. Okay. Right. I actually have another question sure. with regards to the education itself. And I was wondering if you guys have experience teaching different classes and in different colleges here. What um what suggestions would you have for like what would be the first two classes that you think would benefit of using this technology in the classroom? So I think I think the obvious ones are ones where you're trying to teach specific skills in the real world. So a lot of like lab hands-on stuff. So in biology, it's really pipettes. In uh, a lot of the health sciences, it's everything from anatomy, which they use a cadaver, you know, kind of dissection, to uh, like actual kind of clinical things, because there's a lot of simulation stuff there. Jamal teaching, you know, drawing or other kinds of skills that require actual kind of real world. Uh, you know, movements and, and, and things. Um, stuff that I've done, I've talked about training for 3D printers. I also did one for soldering, teaching students how to solder using it. So I think a lot of those, that's like the easiest yeah. one, I, I, I would think, because it makes obvious sense, right? Because right now, it's kind of like a learn by doing model, right? Where the best thing to do is to actually kind of have this, have the tools in your hand, like actually walk through it as a way of being able to do it. Um, I think the other thing is for trying to build up some form of empathy or immersion or an experience. And so we have some faculty say over history and stuff that are looking at ways of using these technologies or um, kind of looking at ways of, of kind of bringing things that were previously, you know, where you use videos or images or stuff like that, they can be more immersive. I think you will see that coming up. Um, and then I think what we'll see further on down the line a little bit, which, which Jamal and I have both kind of dabbled in using uh, you know, augmented reality technologies and other, other things like that, is the more kind of integrated, uh, active learning activity that can be triggered by using XR. So I, I do think that you could end up having a use case where XR could be integrated in learning basically any topic. It's just a question of like, what is um, what is the goal and what are you actually you know, trying to learn? From? So, you know, if we think about trying to use XR technologies to teach mathematics, like, like what are we going to, to do for something like that? I don't know yet. I mean, I, I have some, offhand ideas about it, but I think that that would end up being like the last thing to go, just because it's a field that's been around for so long. It's, you know, say, say mostly theoretical in terms of like the actual stuff that you do. Sure, there's word problems and stuff that you can look at. There's labs and things that you can do, but are you getting that same kind of advantage that you are from some of these other areas? I don't think you are. And so I think that there's got to be more kind of creativity and a deeper dive into the technologies, but we'll, we'll see the actual kind of good use cases uh, that will show up. All right. Thank you.